archive. Um, on this episode, we have Ebony Daly. And if you'd like to, you can introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Ebony. I am a documentary filmmaker from Central California. And I consider myself Blackskin, quote unquote. So that's my mom would be, my mom is Mexican American, my dad's African American. And so I kind of like frame my storytelling around this identity um, and speaking about blackness and Mexicanness, I guess, uh, things like that, mm-hmm. intercultural stuff. Nice. Um, so obviously, like I already mentioned to you, but I came across you through the film front programming um, and they show your film Hamaki Tamarindo and a few other of your works. And I was really struck. Um, I think on a lot of fronts, but I think one, like, namely seeing another, like, Black woman filmmaker um, and, like, being able to, like, connect with that work um, and also, like, having grown up in spaces that are very, like, Black and brown uh, and mm-hmm. having sort of that, like, hybrid culture or, or like, cultural experience in a way, um, just seeing that embodied in the person and then embodied in the work and then, like, also pointing towards the history of like the Africanness of it um, and like pulling all of these connections together was really like fulfilling for me. Um, but like you mentioned already, um, you talked about a little bit where you're from, Central California, but can you tell me a little bit more about like what was home like? Like what were some tastes or smells or like what were just some like fond memories of, of the home? Oh, that's a good question. I think that well, when you asked about tastes and smells, the first thing I thought of was climate or heat, <laughs> which has nothing to do with taste or smells, but it's just like how it feels when you're there, especially in the summer. Um, Central California is like in a valley, and I guess it's kind of desert climate, but not. it's not technically in a desert, um, but it's like super scorching hot, <laughs> and especially in the summer. In the winter, it's not that hot, but... Uh, it's just really dry and I whenever I think of home like my hometown I think of I probably think of that especially now because it's it's August it's still Mm -hmm. summer and I'll be talking to my mom and she'll be like oh man it's so hot outside (laughs) but it it makes me think a lot about like how much time we spent outside even though it was super hot we still spent a lot of time outside because you know we could go out and like play play in this play in the sprinklers um like do like a makeshift slip and slide type things or we would like go out and kind of do like grillings and things like that or I was on the in high school I was on the track and field team so it was a lot of like running outside um and we didn't have AC in my house when I was growing up so it was way better to be outside than it was to be cooped inside and just just dying (laughs) there for the AC so I think that like that when I think of like the weather in my hometown, especially when I'm when I was growing up, I think a lot of like how that prompted me and people around me to be outside for a lot of things and and how how much I appreciate still to this day being outside and and kind of the this whole pandemic has been a little hard on me because we've been inside for the most part. But it makes me think a lot about like how much we appreciate just like being outside and enjoying things, even when it's super hot. But yeah, that's some of the things I think about when I, when I'm home, I guess in terms of like taste, I definitely think of rice and beans, especially like Mexican style rice and beans. Uh, I was like a really picky kid. And so whatever we would eat, maybe I would eat like some menudo or like, some tortillas here and there, but if it was something really elaborate, I would just be like, no, and I would just want my rice and beans, <laughs> my red rice and beans. So uh, to this day, I still really like eating rice and beans, obviously with a lot of other stuff, but uh, that's like definitely one of the things I associate to with my hometown. It's just like mm, rice and beans <laughs> and Mexican food in general. Oh, nice. Yes, similar. Um, very much so the same. You, right now you're in, you're in Mexico, right? Mm-hmm. I'm in Mexico City. So how, how do you define, like, how do you define home now, now that you are um, in, a, in another country, but still a homeland to you, um, and with everything that's happening, having to be inside, having to sort of shift how 
your relationship or like your earlier memories to how home was where you were like outside more has there been a shift and like how how do you define home either then or now I think that how I define home now isn't so much attached to a geographical region it's more so attached to like a community or an identity um, because now since I've lived in Porterville, which is my hometown in Central California, like I've lived in, mm, I think four cities or three cities. I, <laughs> I didn't even count. But um, I live in a, I've lived in a few places where I would consider home, quote unquote, home. And then I think when it really comes down to it, it comes down to like where I find like my community or my identity. I still consider Porterville, Central California home because that's where my family is. Um, but when I went to college, I went to undergrad at, in LA and I felt so connected with LA. I still feel like really myself when I'm in LA because it was like a lot of this, like, or at least when I got there, um, a lot of my classmates, we were all kind of in this program that was called Summer Bridge and it was pretty much for like kids from the hood. <laughs> and it was just a lot of black and brown kids. And so like that black and brown unity, I really felt when I got into that program. And and I guess like I just associate LA, even though I know there's been a lot of history and tension between black and brown communities, I associate it with that like black and brown unity. And I feel like my experience kind of embodies like my, just my background and just like my parents embody also like black and brown unity. Mm -hmm. um, and so I see LA as home in that sense. And then here, it's been really curious to be home, to be home, <laughs> to be here in Mexico City because it also feels like another home um, in the sense that I really like it here in general. I've already been, I've been here for four years now. And, but something that curious that's happened is that whenever my neighbors will put on like a typical quote unquote Mexican music, like, um, it's more like nor Norteño music now. Oh, now I, I realize that it's Norteño music. When I was growing up, it was just quote unquote Mexican <laughs> music for, for me. Um, like it doesn't, it reminds me of Central California. It reminds me of home. And that is always funny for like my roommates or my, my friends here who are from Mexico, born and raised in Mexico. And they're like, it's funny how music from here reminds you of another country. I'm like, yeah, but that's like the music that I grew up in that I grew up with. So I think that even that is telling into how our identities and how we forge our identities and how we forge our communities isn't so tied to like a national border in that sense or like a geographical region, but really like who we make community with or who we grow up with and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so now I feel like, yeah, I definitely feel home is like moving for me. There's another place that I also consider one of my homes even though I've never lived there, <laughs> that's Tijuana. Uh, I did the first film. The first film that I shot was mostly in Tijuana. And that was, that was like my second time or third time going to Tijuana, but my first time actually going and like not being at like a food tourist or not just going for a day trip, like actually going and doing work there. Um, so uh, since the, doing that first film, I just go back Every time I go to Central Cal, I'll fly to TJ and then I'll cross the border because it's cheaper. And also now because I've made community in Tijuana mm -hmm. since doing that first film. So it just feels like another home to me in that sense. And also it's kind of in this in-between of Mexico and the US. And you know, my identity is also this in-between of Mexican American. There's also like a black community there because there are a lot of Haitians there. So it's just like, it's just like a, a place that I also really identify with in a lot of ways and I've never actually lived there and I don't know if I'm ever actually gonna live there but it feels like another home to me just in that sense you know I I learned so much from watching that piece I like one I I knew that like there was a lot of like Haitian migration in like Central and South America and like I knew that that was happening and I, I have a friend who's half Chilean so she was telling me about um there's a large like Haitian population in Chile now but like I don't know I just I guess I just didn't think about like, oh, they, they'd be in Mexico or in like how, how close they are to the, like the US border and how, like there, there's one man in the documentary, he mentioned, yeah, we were in Brazil and like we traveled through all these countries and we went here. And I don't know, similarly in that, like I've never been there, but I think the story and like, just like hearing how much they've worked and how like 
how dedicated they are to like survive and like persevere like in in that way like that felt like a home it felt like comforting it felt um it felt familiar like the the energy in that whole documentary felt so familiar and so like wow like you, you like I don't know I just I feel like I learned so much and I was I felt so close to the people um and like I don't know I felt worldly <laughs> after watching it like you know wow who who'd have thunk it like this this is this is happening they're here and like <laughs> they're um they're establishing their own community they they're learning a new language like there's just so much that is happening and I think that you captured that beautifully in a way that really felt like they like you were there to tell their story like you were there in service of them um and I think like on a filmmaker's perspective like I really appreciate that sort of aspect of like really allowing people to be who they are um and opening the door so that other people can then learn it and it becomes like this like silent mediator <laughs> um and you're, you're you know you are the bridge to like their home their community their their way of life their their new cultures and customs and all those things so that's just me commending you on that project <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> thank you I think it's interesting that you mentioned about your friend who's half Chilean because a lot of the people who sh who are featured in my short actually came well on their like in their journey up to Tijuana they stopped in Chile and a lot of them even worked in Chile for a few months before they went they got to Tijuana. Oh wow! Oh, how everything's connected. Mm -hmm. So I guess can you talk a little bit more about your work, um, whether it be any of your projects prior to Hamaca y Tamarindo or Hamaca and Tamarindo and, and just talk about like what was that experience like for you and what just how did it feel coming back um or coming to your your second homeland and like really um diving into the people and getting to know people and reaching out to people for for your documentary and just what was that experience like for you yeah I think that Something also that I didn't mention earlier about being in Mexico is that I would always say this, especially like in my first few years here, that Mexico, I love Mexico because it's like the excitement of being in a new country, but also the fam familiarity of like knowing the culture and like growing up with the culture. Um, and then I think I even found more of that sort of fami familiarity <laughs> when I met other Black people or Afro-Mexicans or Black people who live in Mexico. Uh, especially when we, when I, <clears throat> I started meeting a lot of them doing the first, the first film, uh, and then we just would become friends and we would talk about our experiences. And even though we grew up on two different sides of the border, a lot of our experiences growing up were really similar, especially like the, the erasure of like a side of our identity, like not people not knowing that we were Mexican or not thinking that we were Mexican and things like that. Um, and especially for them, like Afro-Mexicans have been in the country, have been in Mexico since the beginning of Mexico, you know, they were also brought to <clears throat> this side of the world because of the slave trade. And they've also had a huge presence in the history of the formation of this country. So. So it's been like a lot of erasure on their part. And I feel like I kind of empathize with that in a, in a way, I, even though I'm not a huge fan of the word empathize, but, but I kind of did feel like a shared experience in that sense, even though our contexts are different because also the way that race is manifested on each side of the border is different too. But um, yeah, when I, I was first talking to one of my friends, uh, who's Afro-Mexican, we were talking about food, <laughs> and she was saying how, oh, did you know that La Flor de Jamaica is from Africa? And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> I actually really didn't know that. I always associated it with Mexico. I grew up drinking agua de Jamaica. Um, Flor de Jamaica is hibiscus for, <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know the, that word, and I didn't even realize, I didn't even realize that Flor de Jamaica and hibiscus were the same plant until I started researching for this documentary. <laughs> um, and so I thought that, that was just, just really cool and also something that kind of symbolized home to me in a sense that I, I've always loved food and I've loved like learning about the history behind food, obviously eating food and now cooking food and like 
just a lot of things that have to do with that and especially like tying food like with my culture because a lot of times I feel like it was one of those things where like the language has been lost <clears throat> in a lot of ways in my family like I I like I learned Spanish on my own I grew up around it because I grew up with my grandparents but I definitely like made a huge effort to like learn um on my own and <clears throat> and and I feel like a lot of my cousins don't know Spanish um a lot of people in my generations and my family don't know a lot of Spanish so so food is like the one thing that we have that like that like proves quote unquote that we're Mexican <laughs> um and so then when I learned that Jamaica La Flor de Jamaica was from Africa and that a lot of Caribbean and African countries also use the plant to make teas or to make juices and things like that I was like whoa and I have to like do some sort of something with this because this is like too interesting for me and um also just like it also just became like a symbol of like black Mexican pride of like it's like it symbolizes both for me now I don't have any tattoos but if I were to get a tattoo it would probably be of like the like the flor de jamaica like the hibiscus flower just because it like symbolizes the the two things for me and it's like a food but um <clears throat> but um yeah the the documentary was kind of after a while it was I always wanted to do something on like Afro-Mexican identity and after a while I focused in on Flor de Jamaica and also tamarindo, which is tamarind, <laughs> um, because they're just like two ingredients that are super Mexican. They're super associated with Mexico, at least in like the Latinx community. And um, and they're both plant, two plants that are from Africa, and they're both two plants that are heavily used in like African and Afro diaspora cuisines. Uh, and so <clears throat> that's kind of like where the focus went but they're they're more so like metaphors on like the heritage and the erasure of afro mexicans because they're two plants that are as as i said like a heavy presence in mexico but not many people in mexico know that they're from africa and that goes the same with afro mexicans they've been in this country for centuries and not many people know of their existence so that was kind of like the parallel that i was trying to make in the in the short documentary yeah, it just goes to show, like, how much we are there, how how much, like, our culture, our history is there in every country, and there there's a, probably in, in, in every single, like, major country or cuisine, there's, there's some little piece of, like, oh, they do this, they do this here, or they do this there. Um, there's a guy that I watch on YouTube, Mark Wings, he likes to travel to different countries um, and eat their, like, eat their food. Um, this this man, I love him. <laughs> um, but he had like he had um, a series where he was in like um, a bunch of like West African countries, and just some of the things that they were doing, I was like, oh, like yeah, I do that. I I, I see that direct connection. And then I think it was in Ghana they made like this uh, drink, and I think it was like made with tiger nut. And I was like, that's like horchata. And I was like, yeah. oh my god, <laughs> like growing <laughs> up. Especially, like I said, like growing up in 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 areas like going to school and there are like other like Mexican students and they're, they're always talk about it. And I'm like, I like it, but like, I'm also just like, where did this come from? And then to see that connection, it's like, just mind blown. <laughs> right? <laughs> and that reminds me of yesterday. I don't know if you've seen it on Netflix, but there's a show, it's called like Street Food Latin America something like that mm -hmm. and they there's the episode on brazil that i just watched yesterday <laughs> and how much they eat stuff with black eyed peas and i'm like black eyed peas is so popular and black mm -hmm. communities in the u.s like everything mm -hmm. is so connected mm -hmm. and i think at least for me like i find that to be very humbling and like comforting especially like i don't I, i'm not fluent in any other language and so if i can't communicate linguistically then we can communicate on a food level, we can communicate culturally, and those, I think those things are so important, and I, like, I don't know, I, f I feel like those are um, things that really allows us to cross-culturally build, like, the diaspora to actually, like, function, <laughs> like, I think those are, those are, like, just good ways to pull in people, um, especially when there are like all these like imperialistic like biases that we have been brainwashed to believe 
but these little small things it's like oh oh yeah i am a part of you oh yeah and like once you once you have that in then then you're more willing to like learn about their culture and understand like just how connected you actually are so i think that that's just so beautiful and so like so important yeah exactly me too um so my next question is more about like what has your experience been like um or like as you were working on Hamaki Tamarindo and like just your were there any realizations of like or moments of solace that you found um in bridging both those gaps in your in your identity Mm, moments of solace I think that just speaking to people um, or speaking to my friends, a lot of the people who I interviewed in the, in the documentary are my friends. Um, I think most, all of them are actually, but I think when I spoke to them and just hearing their experiences and just being like, man, that sounds so familiar. And it goes back to what you're saying, how like, even, even if we don't share certain things, we don't share language or we don't share something, there is like such a unifying experience in black community globally that I think is like really important to like touch on. And so every time we spoke or we talked about things that we liked or, you know, my friend talking about my mom, the musician who, who's in the film, he's from Oaxaca and he was talking about how he likes, you know, like, hmm, like Childish Gambino and, you know, he likes a lot of like black American music too. And so um, just like those little things too, about how, like every, how everything is, connected and one of the big moments for me was when we filmed the actual like cooking process of using these quote-unquote Mexican ingredients to make um, African ingredients with my friend who is she's born and raised in Mexico City but her dad is from Senegal and her mom is from Puebla Um, and she's a chef and she kind of specializes in like making food from the African diaspora especially Senegalese food because that's where her family's from um, and also like fusing like Afro, Me- African and Mexican, Afro diaspora, Mexican and stuff like that. So when we were like shooting with her and she was cooking everything and she was explaining like why she got into food and uh, how she learned about, about a bunch of different cultures through food. And then just talking about how she has two different, uh, two different sides of her family that eat totally different and her experiences um, kind of just like ring a true to, not really true. I felt I feel really close with her experience, particularly because she's also kind of like me, where she has like one side is Mexican and one side is black, or in her case, African. Um, whereas a lot of the other Afro Mexicans that I spoke to are like descendants of black people who have just been in Mexico for generations. Uh, <clears throat> and so when she talks about like the two sides, but then how she comes to peace with those two sides and how she makes those she sees the connections between those two sides and she doesn't see them as two different sides she sees them almost as one whole person like that also was re- really reaffirming for me and how I've come how I've come to age with my identity or how I've come to be with my own identity mm-hmm. what were some like how did you come to filmmaking first and how did your early experiences or your early memories of home and culture how did that influence your filmmaking process i think that i came to filmmaking uh, actually because i was always interested in like non-fiction storytelling and that is because when i was in high school uh, i was always into like the technology like photoshop and design and things like that um and I wanted to do computers. I didn't even know what. I was just like, I want to do something in computers when I grow up. And my high school uh, had like a journalism class, but they didn't have a newspaper because they couldn't afford to print a newspaper. Mm-hmm. So they had like a, a blog, a website. And I wanted to join that class so that I could work on the design for for the website. But then when I joined, they put me as a reporter. And at first I was like really nervous and cause I was like, I don't, I don't like to talk to people and, that kind of stuff. Um, and like just really shy, but I ended up really liking it. And so ever since then, I always knew that I wanted to do 
something with like storytelling and I and I did undergrad in undergrad I majored in journalism and then from there I was still kind of in the like tech digital media stuff but I did an internship in the radio in their quote-unquote multimedia department but multimedia for radio is visuals um so it's like the photo department and I loved it. I, I didn't realize like how much I loved like photography and video and things like that until I did that internship. So from there, that's when I want to kind of deepen my relationship with like video and photo. And then I got into filmmaking just kind of as like an, a, like an evolution, kind of like an organic evolution of just that. But um, the reason why I always want to do like these types of stories is one because of like my own identity of being black skin as like I like to say but two I think that I wanted to get into storytelling in general because of where I'm from and because the Central Valley is like not really known in in, in the country in in California much less the country much much less the world <laughs> people in California would never I would when I was in college in LA which is only three hours away from where I'm from like, and I would tell people like, oh, I'm from Central California. Oh, is that near San Francisco? No, it's not near San Francisco. <laughs> like, like in California, people didn't know where it's from. And it's, it's like a region that's just really heavily sidelined, like the news, it's heavily sidelined and everything. And I think that, that that sort of like invisibility of even the geographical region where I'm from just kind of played into how I want to tell stories to like make visible these, these sort of like hidden, hidden regions or like hidden identities. I don't know if hidden is the, the correct word, but yeah, the, the things that we don't normally think about or read about like in our day to day or in the news and things like that. Um, so I do think that like where I grew up plays a lot into like how I see storytelling from for the way that I wanna do storytelling. Do you ever um, plan on making a fictional, like a fictional narrative film or something more like experimental or something outside of the box for you? Uh, I don't have a plan, like, I don't have a concrete plan, but I'm definitely open to it. And I've been more open to it recently. I did a, I recently did a music video with those two friends who are from Oaxaca, who are the musicians. And it was still like slightly documentary style, the music video, but it is like a, something that like a, a script that we created and, you know, we're not interviewing anybody or anything like that. So it's kind of like a, Dip in my dipping my feet into something that's slightly more like narrative and less just like straight strict journalism or documentary. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely, and I've I've thought about I've thought about maybe like writing short stories first to just get my get my brain working, get, get like the stuff circulating in my brain. Also because I really like reading. Um, I really like. It's funny because I love watching. I love watching nonfiction stuff. Like I love watching like documentaries. Like when I watch, it's always like nonfiction. But when I read, it's always fiction. Like <laughs> so, so I think that um, starting with like writing like short stories will help me think about like how to visualize it and stuff. Because I think the way that I like to tell stories is very visual. And I don't think that I think that once I start writing something, I'll start visualizing it right away. Like, oh, you know, what kind of shot would that be? And like, oh, how would that, how would that play out visually and things like that. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Um, I ask that because like I too sort of came to filmmaking in the same way. And so I think it's always really interesting to see or like listen to people who started from a very like journalistic background and like how their take on film is always um it, it's just sometimes it can be always like left the center slightly because there is that that like I think that like drive to like let's get the story let's like really like report <laughs> it like <laughs> let's yeah everything. so I resonate with that <laughs> <laughs> I um, think that's very real <laughs> so like if you were to describe media and like the work that you do as a movement um what do you what do you see your role in that being and you can movement it can be within media or not what do you what would you say your role is or what do you hope your work your role to be wow what a great question <laughs> what, a, 
what is my role? I don't know. I always, when I, when I talk about my work, I like to say that I'm like contributing to the representation and empowerment, like contributing to these conversations. Um, so I guess that that would kind of be my role is like, like a contributor to things that are already happening. Hopefully someone who, um, like when I think about organizing, um, especially like, yeah, organizing for, you know, just like a better life for people. <laughs> but when I think about like community organizing or organizing around a movement or around, uh, yeah, like a collective, collective betterment for a community, for an identity or for a society. Like I think a lot of times like organizing has to do with like the strategy and like the how side, like how are we going to do this? How are we going to build collective power? Um, but I think my role is more in, is, storytelling and I think storytelling is like the why like why are we doing this what is like the what is the origin behind it what's the motivation behind it too who are the people who are experiencing this um and so I think my role is kind of like letting people know or contributing to the why we organize or why do we have these movements or why do we build collective power um yeah I guess I don't know if that's a if that's a great if that's a great yeah. answer but <laughs> I, think I personally I resonate with that as well and I think that that's like super valid and super necessary and like I, I think that that's like the role of artists in general they are to showcase the human <laughs> they are to like really articulate those like nuances and like all the complexities of like what makes this life like worth something or like or not, like however you, you look at that, but like what what is it that's actually happening? What is it, what is it that's actually being impacted? Um, yeah, this is a question that I like often ask people um, and it's interesting to hear different people's perspective on it. But uh, the question is, what would a fully realized world look like to you? Uh, this is something that I've been thinking about a lot lately, kind of just like in my, what is it? I don't even want to say by like evolution of <laughs> I don't want to say by evolution of wokeness. <laughs> no, but like I feel like we go through like this this like this like era era in our lives where we're just like critiquing it all the time and we just like hate everything and you know like F white supremacy, F this, F capitalism, all this stuff. And I feel like now I'm like, I don't know, it's just like always thinking about that and always critiquing everything and always like correcting people or things like that it's just like so tiring on your mind and and I'd rather like think exactly like about the future and like how we're gonna get to a better world instead of just critiquing what's happened and obviously using or researching about what's happened in history in order to get to a better world um so I've been thinking about this a lot but to answer your question um I think that a fully realized world means a world with um, open borders or no borders. <laughs> I think it's a world where, uh, I mean, yeah, black and brown people, or I guess people of all different colors, but in thinking about like the world that we live in now, now like where black and brown people especially have just as dignified as lives as everybody else and have just as much opportunity to do, to do whatever they want as everybody else. I think it's a world where talents are more dispersed instead of just centralized in a certain industry or certain industries. Um, and I think we can learn to appreciate like what's around us and local talents and things like that. Just things being more dispersed. I also think it's a world that has like an abundance of natural resources and water and clean air and a world with really good food and accessible food too. <laughs> I think that's that's something that I've always that I'm interested in, but I don't talk about as much like in my work or I don't work on it as much in my work is like food access. Um, and so I think that that that's something a world that I definitely would love to see too is that you know healthy foods are accessible and available to everybody, not just to the people who are more privileged. Mm -hmm. There's a book that I. Um, I've put on the on a, a couple of like past playlists and I've also um, been like reading very recently because my mother and I have started a garden um, but it's called Farming While Black and it's literally a guidebook that like 
it tells you how to access land like squatters rights it tells you about different herbs different vegetables like how to like replenish your soil it's literally like step-by-step -step guidebook to to farm to have your to have your own and like provide for your family and so yes like i think that that like things like that is so necessary it needs to be in the hands of like all of us everywhere and like yeah i feel that <laughs> Oh, that's great. I've heard about this book. My friend, one of my friends who actually, she just moved from Chicago like two days ago, but she was, she showed me that book when she was here, um, but she took it back with her, obviously, <laughs> to Chicago. Um, so I've been looking for the book. I would love to have a physical copy, but I might just get an ebook copy for now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like, I feel like you should, you should definitely get the physical book. But I think that for me, at least there's something about the tangibility. It, it feels like a sacred text to me because there's so much information and so many like it, it's just so many things that you just you don't want to lose like you if the cloud goes down you're like oh no all these gems are gone like it's, it's it, true it's such a like it, it's a i think it's a staple that needs to be discussed it needs to be like really ingrained in our like education systems and like just how we operate um yeah I, there's just so many ways in which like people of color are targeted um and food being especially like one of those like crucial ways and also like we were mentioning like that is how we are connected that is how we retain our culture and our history um from africa and so to have those things severed or like tainted in a way it's like oh no it's more like it's even more important for us to learn to learn the land to understand what we're doing why we're why we're doing it and like how to properly do it so that the next generation can like live its life <laughs> exactly that was so beautifully put <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> um so are there any other um thoughts that you have or anything that you'd like to add uh anything that i'd like to add i mean i'll say I'm <laughs> speaking in, thinking in spanish but um no i think that i mean i love like the, all the questions about home and i think that that's also something that i've been thinking about a lot too because especially my where i grew up like it's a really small town i remember when i was younger my goal was always that I wanted to go to college so that I could get out of that small town and then like cause there's nothing to do there and all this stuff like um and you know do quote unquote bigger and better things but I th also think that now that I'm like older and now that I'm also not so much stuck in Mexico I mean yeah kind of I mean I've <laughs> lived I live here but like I can't just like fly back as easily as I could like even a year ago too because of the pandemic uh so it really has made me think a lot about like my physical physical place where I grew up um, and how I'm like also reshaping that in my mind to be like a home in the heart to me and not just like a home where I physically grew up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I don't know what else to say. I think thank you so much for, for inviting me. It was a pleasure speaking with you and, and getting to talk to like, I feel like I don't really get to talk to many other black women filmmakers or black women media makers in general. So it's also just like really refreshing <laughs> well, <laughs> to be able to nice. talk to you. Yeah, the feeling is definitely mutual and I'm excited to see like more things that you do and like follow you on your journey. Um, like I said earlier, we often do playlists. Um, and so are there any like books or music or um, movies or things like that that you're like into? They can be related to home or not. Um, but is there anything that you can share with the people? It could be. Yeah, your, you, could, you could plug yourself. <laughs> oh, I can plug myself. Oh, I can plug my social media. <laughs> Well, I guess I'll, I mean, I'll plug my work, <laughs> but there are, there are other things besides myself that I'll also plug. Um, <laughs> so my two documentaries are, um, they're both short documentaries, one's 15 minutes and one's 20 minutes. The first one is called Life Between Borders, Black Migrants in Mexico, and you can find it on Vimeo, it's about public. And the second one is called Jamaica y Tamarindo, Afro Tradition in the Heart of Mexico and that one is like going it's doing it's like virtual screening rounds but if you follow the page on facebook 
<clears throat> Jamaica y Tamarindo Film. Um, we post whenever we have a virtual screening and usually there are like access points where if you email a certain email, you can get access to the film and things like that. Um, but it's actually funny that, you know, this podcast has been like about home and like the meaning of home and stuff like that, because there's always a book that I love to plug whenever someone asks me about like, oh, what are some books that you're really into? And it's called Home Going. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a, the physical copy because I'm in Mexico and <laughs> um and yeah the physical copies of books in english or books that i read in english aren't like heavily available in mexico but it's called home going and it's by ya gyasi ya gyasi i think that's how you describe her name she's ghanaian american and i love this book it's probably like one of my favorite like top three favorite books of all times which is why i desperately want a physical copy <laughs> um and i listened to it and i also like read it in an ebook but it's about two women from West Africa, like back in the 1700s. And they're both half sisters, but they never meet each other. And one woman is sold off into slavery. And the other woman is married off to a British colonizer. And then each chapter follows one of their descendants um, until today. So one, the woman who's sold off into slavery each chapter follows her descendants in the u.s so it goes through slavery through the great migration through the harlem renaissance and then the other line the lineage is like in west africa and then how that sat, that part of the cape coast ends up becoming ghana and then at the end they, it's like it like shows you how it's all connected and it's just like a really beautiful book because it really makes you think about like your ancestry like who are your ancestors like you might have some long lost cousin out there in, in Ghana and in West Africa, or even in the Caribbean or in South America, you, like we don't know. And um, it's also just really beautifully written. Like each character is is really well developed. Each, each chapter is about one character. Um, and yeah, that's like one of my favorite books of all time. And another book that I want to plug is called Sana Sana, which I do actually have the book here. Can I show it? Hold on. Yeah, sure. Give me one second, because it's up on my wall. <laughs> Hold on. It's called Sana Sana, mm. and it's by Ariana Brown, and she's a Black Mexican-American poet from Texas. I think and I it's just to watch some of her poems when I was, like, like early in college. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I used to, like, watch some Oh, uh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she has a lot of, that's how I found her. I just like watched one of her videos. I was like, wow, this girl speaks to me. Like, <laughs> it's like the only poetry book I think I have. I might have like a couple more, but like, oh, I think she's like my favorite. I'm definitely her fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would really recommend. I think she writes beautifully. And I think especially if you're, you're a black woman, um, it's definitely gonna speak to you, this mm. book. And it is on i think it's on if anybody is interested in purchasing the book it i think it's on this website um yes it's about nine or ten dollars i can't remember but yes uh i recommend that and any other things I'm trying to think of like movies i've been watching that street food <laughs> latin america it's series so good. <laughs> it's really good <laughs> uh, yeah that's that's what i've been that's what I've been, uh, oh, there's another book, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been like in a reading, like in this in this pandemic, I feel like I've been listening to a lot of podcasts and reading um, and listening to audiobooks more than I've been like watching movies. <laughs> but um, there's another book called uh, His An African American and Latinx History of the United States. Um, and I recommend that too, because it goes into like the history of each group, but also not just in the US context, like it shows how much of U.S. history with these communities are connected with Black diaspora history from other countries and like Latin America too. So I recommend that book. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so where can the people find you and keep up with you? So people can find me at Ebony Marie B. That's my social media handle for all of the social medias for Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Um, as I said, you can also follow the Facebook page for Jamaica y Damarino, and that's where we post the updates for screenings and things like that. And yeah, 
Um, say hi if you want. <laughs> <laughs> also, you all can follow us at dig3x on Instagram. Um, and thank you so, so much for like being a part of this. I'm really happy and excited. Um, and I was really like watching your, your past Q&A uh, with Filmfront. It was really like, like I said, it was really comforting to like, I just resonated a lot with like how you came to film the stories that you are interested in telling, like all of that. I was like, I like that. So thank you so much for um, coming on this podcast and giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And <laughs> it's like an honor that, that, I don't know, it feels like, it feels like an honor that like other people are resonating, especially like other black women. <laughs> so thank you so much for inviting me and offering this space to me. And hopefully we can keep in touch. Of course. Thank you so much. <laughs>